Hi everyone, so glad you're here today. Uh, one of the phrases you've probably heard uh, lately, if you've been paying attention, is identity politics, uh, which is where political positions seem to be exclusively based on identity issues such as uh, gender, race, sexual orientation, those things. I think a much more sinister problem is when politics becomes your identity. This is one of the great temptations for Christians in 2024 America. Our political polarization has become obvious to everyone, uh, but this is not the most concerning issue. I think what we're witnessing is something greater than just polarization. We're actually witnessing the morphing of politics into a religion. And, and for many Americans, politics isn't just more important than their religion. Politics has actually become their religion. I saw a video recently of a young man who had been kind of raised in a, in a far left home, a TikTok influenced uh, ideology, and he was describing the process of trying to read a couple of books that were recommended to him of a more kind of conservative persuasion to, to balance out his views on the world. And he said he tried for months and he could only read a page or two at a time without going into a full-blown rage or panic attack or having feelings of violence rush over him. And he concluded the video saying, I realized I wasn't exhibiting the behaviors of someone with political opinions. I was exhibiting the behavior of someone who had been indoctrinated into a cult. We saw during COVID, conservative Christians were far more likely to leave their church because of their political beliefs than they were to leave their political beliefs because of the teachings of the church. For many, their political views have become more like a cult or more like a religion than just an opinion about the best way forward for our country. In a recent survey, Americans said overwhelmingly that they would be more unhappy if their kids married someone from a different political party than if they were to marry someone outside of their religion. You probably have a personal story of a lifelong friend or a family member who's gotten so utterly consumed with politics that you can't even have a normal conversation anymore. Trevin Wax says it this way. He says, maybe they've turned to conspiracy theories or they've developed a cult-like devotion to a political hero or they no longer seem capable of finding joy in the world or, or the church due to excessive interest in spotting racism or injustice in virtually every human interaction. And then he says, be it the cult of mega or the cult of wokeism, the result is the same. Their political orientation so defines their identity that they cannot imagine the world any other way. So we're talking this month about true identity. And when your political tribe becomes entwined with your identity, it leads to a term that I learned recently called enmeshment. It's where you become so enmeshed with your political ideology that if someone pushes back on your politics, it feels like they're pushing back on the core of who you are. All your beliefs have become enmeshed into one big ball. And so if someone critiques your political leader or your party, it's like they're critiquing your deepest values, which is your you at your deepest center, your very identity. And this is why, you know, when someone says something negative about Trump, for example, the response could be, you know, so what, you, you want to murder babies? You know, that, that, that's not just one leap, that's a hundred assumption leaps that, that got to that conclusion. It's, it's enmeshment. All of those beliefs hang together. I heard a, a liberal journalist talking about questioning the impact uh, of the school closings during COVID on her kids. And one of her liberal colleagues said, I can't believe you're a homophobic white su supremacist. Again, these are issues that are not even closely related unless you have enmeshment. All the opinions of your political tribe hold together like a big ball of yarn that's enmeshed with your very identity. So to challenge that is to challenge you. And so we come back to our big idea for this series. In Christ, you become most fully yourself. 
We talked last week about our robust, comprehensive identity in Christ. You were adopted, you were redeemed, you were sealed in him. He alone deserves your allegiance. And yet so many, and yes, so many Christians seem so willing to give that identity away to lesser things. And one of them is politics. And I realize, you know, I'm, I'm wading into some treacherous waters this month, okay? And, and lots of you are gonna agree or disagree with certain things I say. Please know that, that while there have been lots of eyeballs on these messages before today, certainly from our teaching team, from our elders, other leaders at Grace, I am not preaching Grace Church policies this month. We don't really have policies around this kind of stuff. In fact, one of our values as a church through our future church journey says it this way. It says, we invite conversation. And the because statement that goes with that is because authenticity disarms divisiveness. And so my goal today is just to go to the scriptures, to do my very best to mine the truth from God's word on each of these somewhat controversial subjects. And so we have life groups for conversations. We have a live, some live podcast experiences this month toward the end of the month. And just we encourage conversation, godly, loving, respectful conversation. Because here's the deal. The church isn't called to be uniform, but we are called to be unified. Jesus prayed for our unity. And while our culture becomes more and more polarized, it's more important than ever for the church to be unified. We must keep our unity squarely in Christ while having honest and robust conversations around issues that we disagree over. In fact, just do a little mental experiment right now. Picture dividing up Grace Church between Republicans and Democrats. We'd get two big groups on either side of the room. And what if we said, you know what? We just don't get along anymore. So let's just split our church and start two separate churches, the Democrat grace and the Republican grace. And I would just ask you this question. Would our community be better for that? Would our region be better for that? Like, could you still be in a life group with your, with your group? Our divided world needs a unified church that can show the way toward love and grace and civility. I like how Joshua Ryan Butler puts it in his book, Party Crashers. He says, Jesus invites you to bring your lean, but submit your bow. We can lean toward different political perspectives, but our bow, our allegiance belongs to Jesus. See, the danger is when that lean becomes a bow, a different center of your life that actually becomes, uh, your politics become like a functional religion. We've seen in recent years the extremes on the far left and the far right actually moving the whole conversation to the political extremes. Where if you don't become a full-blown nationalist on the right or a full-blown activist on the left, you get cast out. This is where politics becomes an idol, a functional religion. Butler breaks it down further. He points out actually four political ideologies that can turn into idols. So you'll see this graph here. The horizontal axis is political left and right. The vertical axis is modern and postmodern. You can read his book if you want more detail on this. I found it very, very helpful. But, but the top left then is the, the modernist left-leaning, which he titles the religion of progress. This is the smart quadrant. People who up here value science and technology and institutions to change the world for the better. This is the Steve Jobs of the world, the Bill Gates, or more currently Sam Harris or Mark Zuckerberg. So, so these folks have lots of faith in the university system, particularly the, the STEM department. This is the way to change the world. Now, in the upper right is the religion of responsibility. This is the free quadrant. This is the modernist, politically right approach that has a strong belief in hard work and family values and personal ownership to build flourishing communities. The, the, the rally cry of this quadrant is pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Think suburbs, think Wall Street, think free market and strong business. The, the heroes of this quadrant are Ronald Reagan and, and more recently people like Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, the dirty jobs guy, Mike Rowe. All right, the bottom left, which is the more left-leaning postmodern quadrant could be titled the religion of identity. This is the social justice movement. And the motto here is live your truth. This encapsulates the left's strong belief in self-expression, anti-discrimination, and tackling oppressive systems to build a more just society. Heroes in this quadrant started with people like MLK and more modern spokesmen like uh, Tanahasi Coates, AOC, uh, Ibram Kendi, Jazz Jennings, and loads of TikTok and YouTube influencers. Finally, 
The postmodern right is what he calls the religion of security. This is the loyalty quadrant where there's a strong belief in down-home local identity, the protection from external threats to establish the conditions for a thriving community. So, so in this quadrant, there's lots of concern about things like the deep state, about fake news, about big pharma, about build the wall, about drain the swamp. And some modern heroes here are Vivek Ramaswamy and Sean Hannity, Dana White of the UFC. So it's it's worth observing that all four of these values are good in their proper place. Progress, responsibility, justice and identity, security. And yet each of these values can also become distorted when it's made ultimate and when it's uprooted from God's design for the world. But, but imagine, j just knowing this approach here, if we approached our political opponents with the assumption that at a heart level, maybe they're motivated by something good. There's something to learn from their perspective. And again, I'm not naive, guys. I realize that there are evil forces at play on all sides of the political perspective these days. And not everyone is properly motivated. Corruption is a huge problem, maybe the biggest problem in our political system. But most normal people that you know and I know are not evil when it comes to their political views. However, when these political views become like a religion, the driving force of our identity, well then anyone who disagrees with my politics must be evil and needs to be silenced or stopped. So I want us to go to a few scriptures today and look at where does our identity in Christ leave us politically? And here's the first thing I want you to see. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven first. I want you to listen to Paul's simple statement in Philippians 3.20. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, yes, we are citizens here in this country, but our primary citizenship as Jesus followers is not here at all. Our, our Savior is, is not our favorite political candidate. Our Savior is Jesus himself, and he's not from here. And he is, but he's one day gonna return and he's gonna fix this broken planet. And until then, our job is to represent him well to this world. There's a second passage that I wanna take you to. J Jesus had a moment where these two kingdoms collided and his response was brilliant in providing principles for us to consider. So would you look over at Mark 12, Mark 12, uh, 13 to 17. So it says this, and they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. This is Jesus. And they came and they said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. It's an interesting description of Jesus. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now, I want you to notice that the religious leaders here were setting a trap. So when in doubt, they thought, you know, ask him about politics. <laughs> is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? The question is not sincere. And the trap is this. If he says, pay your taxes, then he's gonna be very unpopular with the people. They resented the tax, they hated the Romans, they thought it was idolatry to submit themselves to Rome or to do anything that would further the Roman cause. On the other hand, if he says don't pay your taxes, he's gonna be in trouble with Rome. They're gonna squash him as a revolutionary. And so his famous response, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar, give to God the things that are God's, is a foundational statement for the Christian way of looking at issues of God and government. Jesus refused to choose sides. Instead, he reminded the Pharisees that God's agenda was way bigger than Caesar's, and then he makes this crucial distinction there are governments of the world, and there's the kingdom of God. Give the governments of the world what belongs to them, be a good citizen, and give to God what belongs to him. And when these two kingdoms are in conflict, God's kingdom always wins. I'm reminded of a quote from Dr. Tony Evans who said, Jesus didn't come to take sides, he came to take over. So, so make no mistake, Jesus is Lord. But, but listen, the, because of that, the church from the start was seen as a political threat. 
So, so the relationship of the church to the polis, that the Greek term for city or state, from which we get the word politics, polis, has been as varied as the governments that have exi- existed through human history. So the first century church emerged within a society in which being a Christian was seen as, uh, quite frankly, politically treasonous. In fact, if you think that the church was never political, you, you're, you're wrong. The, the central Christian proclamation, just take that, Jesus is Lord, was a political statement. It had to do with who is the rightful ruler of the world. In Jesus' day, everyone knew Caesar was Lord. He was the top dog. He was the man in charge. In fact, there was an ancient uh, political edict inscribed in a stone that was found from 9 BC, and it used strangely familiar language in talking about the government. Listen to this. It says that the Roman Empire celebrated the gospel, the good news, the euangelion of Caesar Augustus's arrival, the, the gospel of Caesar Augustus and made his birthday the beginning of the calendar year because when everything was falling into disorder, a Caesar, the Lord, restored it once more and he gave it a whole new aura. He was sent to his descendants as a savior to put an end to war and he has set all things in order, fulfilling all the hopes of earlier times. The people should have faith and consider his arrival as the beginning of all things. Now that's quite a job description. (laughs) But notice these words, the words gospel and faith and Savior and Lord, words we tend to think of as religious today, were loaded with political significance. Even the word ecclesia, the one that Christians chose to use for the word church, was a political word. It was the same word that was used for a group of Athenians that would meet 30 to 40 times per year to vote on decrees that would affect the whole region. It was a political gathering, an ecclesia, and a preacher or a herald would oversee that political meeting. And so when Christians proclaimed Jesus as Lord, when they gathered in their ecclesia to celebrate this new Lord, people would hear that to mean, if Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not. When Christians formed this ecclesia, it would have been seen as a threatening counter movement to the empire. In fact, early Christians were certainly labeled unpatriotic for failing to get on board with the political system of the day. They weren't just having little services on the side on Sunday mornings when they talked about praying and you know, not, no more lusting and no more swearing and don't smoke cigarettes or whatever. <laughs> Rome couldn't have cared less if that's all they were doing. But they were constantly in hot water because they were seen as serving a different king. And sometimes that kingdom was opposed to what the government was up to. Now listen, it wasn't always like that. Just a few centuries later that the situation was reversed when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire and the government and the church then merged and they became one and this was a terrible development because the church doesn't do well with political power. And so this confluence led to some very dark times when people were being forced under penalty of death to become Christians. From those two extremes eventually emerged the American experiment, the first nation founded on, you know, ostensibly Judeo-Christian principles with hallmarks like religious liberty and inalienable human rights. And so how a Christian should relate to politics clearly depends on the time, the place, the society, the government, but the biblical principle remains the same. It's our primary citizenship is in God's kingdom. Now, over the years, many have gotten this mixed up thinking that their earthly nation was somehow God's favorite or that they could somehow merge the kingdom of God into their political views. But, but even a nation like America with our unique Christian roots is still part of the kingdoms of this world that the Bible talks about, to which we don't ultimately belong. So we can see the implications of this as it relates to specific political issues. God's perspective doesn't fall neatly into one political category or another, which means at times Christians will find themselves vehemently disagreeing with mainstream cultural norms, not because we're being a stick in the mud or or trying to halt progress, but because we're citizens of a different kingdom. We can bring our lean, we must submit our bow. We have to allow our faith filter to preempt our party filter. And this forces us to be more nuanced. It forces us to be more careful, even more humble when it comes to how passionately we draw our political lines. So so when you look at the Bible and you try to guess whether Jesus would have been a Democrat or Republican, it's not as easy as you might think. Everybody wants Jesus on their team. 
And so on the one hand, you may think God is a political conservative. And, and so, so it seems like he's, he's pro-business. He, he demands work rather than welfare for those who can work. He, he, he sanctions capital punishment for murderers. He values the life of the unborn. He gives greater wealth to some uh, more than others. And he calls that good. Uh, he upholds the family as the basic social structure for the world. And so now before you take a screenshot of those, unless, unless, unless you're going to take one of the next list as well, just hang on a second, because you can also read the Bible and come away convinced that God would find himself at home as a political liberal. He, he demands that governments care for the poor. He calls for massive debt forgiveness. He demands that we care for the environment. He rails against the powerful and wealthy when they abuse their privilege with no accountability. He's always for the immigrant. And so everybody wants to pick and choose aspects of the Bible and make Jesus the mascot of their party's cause. But Jesus is not a mascot. <laughs> He's the Lord. He does not submit himself to our causes. Instead, our causes must submit themselves to Jesus. Now, let me be clear. I'm not advocating a neutered political approach or a centrist position that, that just try, tries to find the middle ground on every issue. Because centrists and, and even independents, libertarians, whatever, they're still defined by the same political grid as the right and the left. Christians have a different grid. The, the kingdom of God is another thing entirely. And, and to try to cram it into our political system would be like trying to play a basketball game on a football field using football rules. They, they are two different things. And, and so I think a massive problem in the church today, especially in the U.S., is that Christians tend to hold the Bible in one hand and secular politics in the other and just kind of see the two things as equal sides of the same coin. And we fail to let the Bible shape our politics. And instead, what happens more, more often than not is that we form opinions about our secular politics, and those opinions are influenced by our news feeds and our talking points on our social media. And then we go back to the Bible and we try to find proof texts that are going to reinforce our secular political views. I see plenty of Christians who seem more passionate about the Second Amendment than the Second Commandment. And the fact that you probably know what one of those things is and not the other is ma making my point for me. I see others spouting clearly unbiblical ideas about their social issues, about their sexual choices, about other hot topics, and suggesting that the Bible just says don't judge, and so just leave us to our moral free-for-all and be a good Christian over there. Here's what the Bible's clear on. It's clear on its warnings against letting our hearts become co-opted by the kingdoms of this earth, which is exactly what's happening in both of those instances I just described. The main metaphor, actually, that the Bible uses to describe a Christian's relationship with politics is one of exile. We're exiles. We're sojourners. We are citizens of another kingdom. This is not our political home. Exiles don't let the political empire determine what the moral grid looks like or what categories are available to them to choose from. Those are determined by our true king. And I'll say a bit more about this at the end, but I, I think it's important for Christians when we think about this citizenship is to kind of rank their citizenry. So, so number one, we are citizens of God's kingdom. Here's what I would put at number two. Number two, I would say we are local citizens of a particular community. This is where all of our loving of neighbor gets lived out. This is where the fruits of the spirit are put on display. This is where we fight to bring justice where there's injustice. And then number three, we are national citizens. Listen, there's so much emphasis on elections and drawing battle lines on national issues that I think it actually downplays the importance of the first two areas of focus, which in the end are infinitely more important for us to live out our faith. So the second thing I want you to see in answer to where does identity in Christ leave us? The second thing is we are members of a global multi-ethnic church. So not only does our identity in Christ place us first and foremost as citizens of a heavenly kingdom, the earthly expression of that kingdom does not come in the form of nations. It comes in the form of a church, a spiritual family, and not just a local church, but a global multi-ethnic church. Now, I'm going to talk a lot more about this next week when we look at identity issues surrounding race, but listen to this passage that talks about the inaugural gathering of the kingdom of God in heaven from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. 
John says, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hand and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so here we see the fullness of our identity the fullness of God's image represented in his collective body, the church. Listen, I, I really love our country. I really love the United States with, with all our foibles and flaws. We are a great country. I'm proud. I'm very thankful to have been born here. I love the cities in America. I love the geography, the sports, the freedoms. But the more we get sucked into the American political opinion vortex, the easier it is to forget that we are more closely united at heart, at a, at a heart level, to other Christians around the world, from Iran, Afghanistan, China, Syria. We are more connected to them at a heart level than, than we are even to someone who votes like us in our country and yet does not follow Jesus. I'm family with Christians around the, the world at, at a whole different level than my non-believing American political allies. Christ's kingdom exists throughout the world, which means you have spiritual brothers and sisters. You have spiritual mothers and fathers scattered across the globe. And your primary allegiance is to Christ and to his global family, which speaks thousands of languages and, and, and resides in hundreds of countries. Many members of your multi-ethnic family also love many things about their earthly nations that they were born into. They love the geography and the culture and the food and the sports of their countries too. But we all live as strangers and exiles in a foreign land. And, and it's not just the world. We're not just strangers in this world. We're strangers in our own countries of origin. And our allegiance is always to Christ and to his global multi-ethnic church. Just as a thought experiment, can you imagine Christians from another nation holding their faith and their flag together as equals like some Americans do? Imagine them saying things like, yes, I'm a Christian, but when it comes down to it, I'm, I'm, I'm a Syrian first. I'm a Pakistani first. I'm a North Korean first. That, that language just doesn't even make sense when we're members of a global multi-ethnic family under the umbrella of the kingdom of God. Here's the third identity, the, the third place that identity in Christ leaves us. It's that we are ambassadors of Christ to the world. It's never been more important for us as Jesus followers to engage the world well as we approach another election season. Jesus called us to be a light. Remember this passage in Matthew 5, 16. He says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Far more important than our individual political views, far more important than being right about everything is our commitment to the mission of Jesus, to being a light through our good deeds to the world, to, to go through this season in a way that represents Jesus well. And if we don't, our culture will write us off again as part of the problem in the world, and that would be on us. We are ambassadors here. We are sent with a mission. Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Peter calls us aliens and strangers on this planet. We are immigrants and aliens and ambassadors here in this world. And we must always remember that because you know what ambassadors do? That they represent one nation while living in another. Their citizenship is never in the new nation. They're just there to represent their home country on foreign soil. Our home country is the kingdom of God. Our foreign soil is the U.S. We are ambassadors of Christ here. This title of ambassador also affects how we treat people. Like if you saw your neighbor, regardless of the deepest divides in political ideologies or party alignments or, or pain that they have caused you even, they're an image bearer of God. And as an image bearer of God, you must love them with the love of Christ. Remember when Jesus put his first group of 12 kingdom ambassadors together, the disciples. He chose a zealot, Simon, from a very charged political party that hated Rome, even violently. And Matthew, a tax collector who work, worked for Rome. He'd chosen to side with Rome and represent Rome. These choices, and there were many more, surely led to lots of interesting conversations around the campfires at night. But Jesus did this on purpose because he's building a community 
that went beyond politics. He was building unity around a common savior and a common mission. And it's possible to have stark political differences and to still be ambassadors for King Jesus. And our world is desperate to see that right now. And it is what God calls his church to be. And so what does that actually look like? Well, I said earlier that political engagement has looked as diverse over the centuries as the societies and governments in which the church existed. And so again, I wanna draw your attention back to a book. It's called Party Crashers by Joshua Ryan Butler. Uh, he, He gives some great creative options for political engagement. Most people think that there are only three options when it comes to political engagement. The elephant option, which is pledge your full allegiance to the Republican Party and enthusiastically support anything it does. The donkey option, pledge your allegiance to the Democratic Party and enthusiastically support anything it does. Or the ostrich option, which is bury your head in the sand and hope it all blows over. There are actually some other options. So I'm gonna present a few very quickly and then I wanna drill down a a little bit on one particular one as as we close. The first is what Butler calls the Daniel option, which just means some of you are probably called to go ahead and get involved in the political landscape. Run for office, run for school board or for councils. Daniel is such an amazing biblical figure who worked in the heights of one of the most evil governments in history, and he did it with character and integrity. The second option is the prophetic option. So so Daniel worked from within the system. The prophetic option works from outside the system to try to bring reform. Martin Luther King Jr. would be a good historical example of this. Third is the scuba option, which dives deep on one particular issue to become an expert or an advocate on that issue. William Wilberforce, who spent most of his life working to abolish slavery in England, would be a great example of this. But maybe it's advocating for for special needs children or foster care or some other cause that, that you pour your life into in order to make an impact, either in or around the political parameters you're working with. Fourth is the monastic option. The poor old monks got a bad rap in that many people think they just withdrew and fled from society. Actually, they were focused on transforming society by forming an alternative community within it that that was so beautiful that it would get the society's attention. Their, Their efforts in agriculture and education and construction actually transformed Europe. Monastic communities addressed poverty and community development and educational, national security, environmental stewardship. And they did it all without holding government positions. The the last one, the one I think could be a really good starting place for all of us, is called the local option. You know, people get really worked up and opinionated about national politics. It dominates our news feeds, our conversations, our our social media feeds. But the Bible has a, a whole lot more to say about local community involvement, much more than national political opinions. So so there's a rich Christian history around prioritizing the local, to be localized and embodied. And it means developing real relationships. Your neighbors are your actual neighbors, not some disembodied concept out there that the Bible tells me to love. I think about God's command to be his people who were, who were in exile in, in Jeremiah 29 where he says, seek the peace of the city and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. God commands the entire remnant of Israel to build up the city that they find themselves in and to serve it. Notice he didn't say country, he said city, the place where you actually live. That's where change should be poured into. That's where change will actually come out. So so political engagement in our democratic system, this also enables us to love our neighbors at a systemic level locally. To, to love our neighbors, to want our neighbors to have the same opportunities, the same freedoms, the same protections that we enjoy, even when those neighbors are from very different circumstances than we are. By the way, when we pray for revival in our land, loving one's neighbors is a first principle of all Christian movements of awakening and, and renewal. So by way of next steps today, I have two questions for you to ponder in your, in your chair time this week. One is, What would it look like for me to love my neighbor locally? And two, back from our definition from last week, ask yourself, if I am adopted and redeemed and I am sealed in Christ, how should I interact with someone who is different politically from me? God bless you guys. I love you very much.